we're going to use resource-based theory, a tool I first encountered during my research that I used to analyse the knowledge and experience within technology firms. Now we're going to use the same model, but the other way around, as a tool to identify and construct the necessary knowledge and experience for your technology company. There are three types of resources. The first are the tangible ones, physical equipment, materials, and the business infrastructure that are the real assets in the business and that are actually quite easy to understand. The second type of assets are the intangible ones, the trade secrets and ways of doing things that are not written down that make your firm unique. This also includes what we talked about in the last podcast, those relationships you have built up with your customers and suppliers. They are hard to define, but are as valuable as the physical assets. Finally, there are the human resources that make it all happen. Now, it isn't as simple as creating an organisation and letting it happen. It's much more complicated than that. Often it's the culture that the organisation develops that is most critical. It's how you bring these three components together, the tangible, the intangible and the human resources in a unique way. Every organisation is unique. You have to create your own mix of tangible, intangible and human resources and then create the culture that will glue them all together. And that is what I enjoy doing more than anything else, building new organisations, either building new capability in an existing organisation or even better, building one from scratch. It's exciting, it's fun, it can often be very, very frustrating, but even with all that, I think it's one of the greatest experiences you can ever go through in your entire life. It made me realise that my entrepreneurial destiny wasn't about making products. It was about building organisations. That's what my business was going to be all about. Helping grow people, develop people and building businesses around people. That's my passion. So when you get down to the nitty gritty, there are often very clear capabilities your organisation will have to develop. You need to make sure that you have all the necessary knowledge to perform the daily activities of your business, both technical and non-technical. As employees perform their job, they also create new knowledge and new ways of doing things. And it is absolutely essential that you capture this new knowledge and codify it so that others can use it too. In terms of the specific capabilities you have to develop, it falls into the standard categories of knowledge, R&D teams that can conduct product development activities, produce the products, purchase the right materials to make the products at the right price, and then market your products to consumers. The list goes on and on, financing, accounting, sales. You need to make sure that you have them all covered either inside or outside your organisation through contracts. You have to be able to transform knowledge into proprietary ways of doing things in your firm that you and only you can do that eventually ends up as products, processes or services. Often it is the way that you make the products, not the products themselves, that create the most value in a firm. It wasn't the sonars that made Tritech special, it was the way they made them and made many other things over and over again. Richard Marsh was able to sell the business because he built a self-sustaining organisation. Core competencies are a way of conceptualising and categorising the key knowledge generating activities within your firm. This is all about capturing the key knowledge generating activities and building an organisation that can function for the long term, not just for your first product launch. This is all about creating areas of functional excellence and communities that don't just generate knowledge, they create new ways of developing knowledge. Large firms often have well-defined communities of practice that are built around their core competencies within functional activities like R&D, sales marketing, or within subsets of these specific areas of expertise within R&D or sales and marketing that are critical and special to their business. These competencies are required in every market, so the deeper the expertise and capability you build within your business, the more chance you have of entering new markets. As I said earlier, you build the knowledge to do the job you have to do today, but also build new ways of doing it in other areas that you can then expand into new technology sectors. It's not just about building knowledge for today, it's about building knowledge for the future that it increases your capability and ability to move into new market sectors. 
Core competencies can actually become an Achilles heel. A boss of mine used to say that the true definition of an expert is someone who knows more and more about less and less. Shane calls this developing core rigidities. Firms can become locked into the competencies necessary for the current paradigm and current business, and they lose sight of the ability to develop a learning organisation that does what it has always done well, but can still learn how to do it better and learn how to do things that are completely new to them. Core rigidities was a new term to me. I used to know them as organisational silos. People and communities believe they need to focus and become excellent at what they have always done, like the total focus on bleach in Procter & Gamble's laundry R&D teams in the early 90s. This is more common than you would believe, and I have always struggled to confront organisations and their inherent desire to form these silo structures based on the status quo. The paradigm will shift at some point, and if your organisation is in silos built around the current business and the current activities, your company arteries are clogged with core rigidities, and you will not be able to navigate the shift in S-curves that is necessary when the paradigm ultimately shifts. The final topic I want to discuss today is strategic dissonance. It is when the organisation and the senior people within it start to become misaligned and disagree over the corporate strategy and objectives. There are two things you can do. It either means that the manager's instinct is right and the business strategy is wrong, or it could be that the senior managers have simply become disillusioned with the organisation and it may be time for them to move on. So you have to do something to confront this. First, confirm it using data, facts, market and technology intelligence to evaluate if those management instincts have real substance. Talk to people at every level of the firm, and if it has substance, start dedicating resources to the new strategy. What you've done is spotted an incoming paradigm shift, and what you're trying to do is to gear your organisation to shift onto the next curve when the time is right. If the data doesn't support it, then it reinforces that you need to stick with the status quo and probably have a serious conversation with the senior managers because it sounds as though the time is now right for them to move on to probably setting up their own business. And that's something you have to deal with. And we'll talk about this later when we discuss building organisations. It is quite common that the organisation that exists later on in the venture is very different from the one that was there at the start. You need different types of people to navigate through different phases of your business. So as a management team, you need to recognise when you're about to move into a new phase of the business and then assess whether you have the right people on board for the next phase of the journey. So strategic dissonance isn't bad. It's actually an indication that things are about to change and you need to prepare or that maybe there's maybe some misalignment within the management team and it's time to think about whether you really have the right group of people around the table and build the next generation of organisational capability. So hopefully this series of podcasts has given you some structure and tools to think about resources and the type of capability you need to build within your new organisation. Thanks for listening. We are I.O. We are I.O. stands for valuable, brave, inimitable and organised. Let us now look into the specifics of We are I.O. We stand for valuable. A resource is valuable if it helps the organisation meet an external threat or exploit an opportunity. While it may not help the firm outperform its competitors, it can still be labelled as friends. One good way to think about the valuable resources is to ask how to how do they help the company? Common, common competitive foundations, aka the general building blocks for a firm, are efficiency, quality, customer responsiveness, and innovation. If a resource helps bring out any one of these four things, then it is valuable. For example, for an educational institute, having professors who have written international journals and have PhDs is a valuable. Textile firms making defect-free products is valuable. Rare. A resource is rare simply if it is not widely possessed by other competitors. Of the criteria, this is probably the easiest to judge. For example, 
Coke's brand name is available, but most of com Coke's competitors like Pepsi, etc., also have widely recognized brand names as well, making it not that way. Of course, Coke's brand may be the most recognized, but that makes it more valuable and not more rare in this case. For a university, having international accreditation can make it rare when compared to the other universities in the country. Also, a textile company delivering garment at service levels that are better than service level agreements can make the company rare among all the suppliers. Inimitable. A resource is inimitable and non-substitutable if it is difficult for another firm to acquire it or substitute something else in its place. This is probably the toughest criteria to examine because given enough time and money, almost any resource can be imitated. Even patents only last 17 years and can be invented around the same even less time. Therefore, one way to think about this is to compare how long you think it will take for a computer to imitate or substitute something else for that resource and com compare it to the useful life of the product. Another way to help determine if a resource is inimitable is why or how it came about. Generally, intangible resources or capabilities like corporate culture or reputation are very hard to imitate and therefore inimitable. Like, for example, the corporate culture of the Tatas. A university that has a Nobel Prize winner, a Nobel laureate as professor, can make them inimitable. For a textile company, having a long-term strategic tie-ups with supplier for, with customers for supply of garments for companies such as Gucci or Versace is inimitable. If one of the customers such as Gucci by strategic stake in the garment company, then inimitability increases further. Organized. A resource is organized if the firm is able to actually use it and currently utilize it. Generally, organization is frequently neglected by strategy because it often deals with the inner works of firm management. The good news is that rarely are firms not organized to exploit their valuable resources. However, if your analysis if your analysis does turn up a valuable, rare, and inimitable resource that the firm is not taking advantage of, then this should probably be your number one recommendation. Typically, we have seen a lot of companies who don't identify initiatives that make them rare and inimitable. And surprisingly, we have also seen companies who identify such initiatives and don't get organized to implement them. The VRAO framework. We can now see a VRAO framework which helps us find out our strategic and competitive advantages. You can notice that there are six columns out of which the first four are for valuable, rare, immutable, and organized. And the next two columns are for competitive and economic implications. We can add n number of columns depending on the strategic goals of your organization. For example, like impact to revenue, impact to employee satisfaction, impact to profitability, and so on. So when we look on the first one of the framework, it is indicating that the resource is not valuable and is not being exploited by the organization. This means that the organization does not have any resource that is valuable and hence it has a disadvantage in competition. And the economic implement implications are below normal. The second row indicates the resource is a valuable resource but is not rare. This means that most of the competitors also have same and similar kind of resources. Hence, there's a parity in competition. The third row here indicates the resource is both valuable and rare, but it is not inimitable. This implies that the competitors can create substitutes in given time and can become a threat to the competition. Hence, this resource will only be a temporary advantage and not a sustained advantage, and so economic implications are above normal. 
when a resource is weight valuable rare inimitable and being organized then we have a competitive advantage which is sustained for a long long time because there is no one else who could imitate us and this also implies that the economic implications would be very high swot analysis from our experience we have noticed that vrio is most effective after doing the swot analysis so before we see the application of the vrio framework let us go through swot before trying to gain competitive advantage one must know where he stands and what is what are his or her internal strengths weaknesses along with the opportunities available and the threats that could be faced the swot analysis is primarily a strategic planning tool you will evaluate strengths weaknesses opportunities and threats of an organization or a process or a business swot analysis helps you find the goal setting process and provides a context for future strategic planning discussions because it helps you understand that these are my strengths and weaknesses and how do i make use of opportunities and counter threat strengths and weaknesses are internal to your organization meaning that these could be within your processes people technology or partners but opportunities and threats originate outside the organization there could be opportunities in the market opportunities to make a better product than your competitor for example we decided to use these webinars as an opportunity to share knowledge with everyone threats are external for a, for a, for example strikes or government rules which could impact your organization negatively now let us look at a hypothetical swot analysis matrix created for one of the leading technological organizations in the world we would like to call it capital inc let me restate that all these examples are just my perspectives and not endorsed by lasif or anyone the first column consists of strengths and opportunities which are positive to your organization and the second column consists of weakness and threats which are negative to your organization similarly the first row indicates strengths and weaknesses which are internal to your organization and the second row indicates opportunities and threats which are external to your organization let us talk let us start talking by about the strengths of the organization apple this organization fosters innovation and has created products which revolutionize the technology the quality and the durability of the product are unmatched the brand name and value of this organization is probably the largest in the world making them one of the biggest technology brands with this brand name they demand an unbeatable customer loyalty once a user starts using capital products there is no turning back along with all the above they have great visionaries as leaders leading them to share heights hence all of the above innovation quality brand customer loyalty and leadership could be the strengths now coming to their weaknesses their products are highly priced and are not available by all their products work only on their software and are not portable customization and flexibility of the products is another area of weakness and finally the battery life of the product is also a weakness opportunities are a plenty with the ever growing mobile table tablet and computer industries the demand for cloud services is also a bonus also they could tie up with other organizations to make better products and start creating products which run on other operating systems such as mentioned they could also start a new line of products tries to attract the masses creating a whole new market now coming back to the threats threats could be in the form of other competitors but the main threat they face today is from smartphones based on other operating systems which are priced from as low as $80 and go up to $100 US dollars now that we have completed the swot analysis we could now map these characteristics to the vrio framework and find out the implications to competitive advantage and other strategic priorities 
Now we can see the VRIO framework in front of me. There are seven columns which in which the first one indicates the characteristics, the same, the details, the next four for the VRIO, and the last two are the strategic priorities. Here we are talking about strategic competitive advantage and impact on profitability as a strategic priority. When we take the first trend as innovation, it is valuable, rare, inimitable, and being organized by the organization. Hence, it gives a strategic competitive advantage which is high and also high impact on the profitability. Second, quality of a product is valuable, rare, but it is not inimitable because there are other competitors who are giving such quality products and right now it is being organized by organization. Hence it is giving them a medium strategic competitive edge and a medium impact on the profitability. The brand value and name are all valuable, rare, inimitable and organized and cannot be matched by any other competitor. Hence it's giving it a high strategic competitive edge and a high impact on profitability. Coming to the weaknesses, premium pricing when removed, that is giving new product, products at a lot, much lesser price would make it valuable and rare, but it is being done by other competitors and it is not inimitable and it is not being done by the company yet, so it is not organized. Hence giving it a medium strategic competitive edge and a high impact on profitability as it will get a new market. When the organization creates a product which are both customizable and flexible, then it would make the product valuable, giving it a strategic competitive edge which is low and high medium impact on profitability. When the battery life of the products is increased, it would become valuable, rare, not inimitable and it is not currently being organized by capital, hence giving it a medium strategic competitive advantage and a medium impact on profitability. Similarly, there are many other opportunities like starting on right product line, like having an another operating system which would make it valuable, rare, giving them a medium strategic competitive advantage and a high impact on the profitability. By starting a lower price product lines also would make it valuable and rare giving them once again a medium strategic competitive advantage and a high impact to their profitability. Here you would have seen that we are not mentioning threats in the VRIO framework because threats are external to an organization and cannot be controlled by us. Let us go to the levels of impact on profitability. A high impact indicates a direct and a major impact that is measurable. A medium impact on profitability indicates a direct and not major impact that is measurable. A low impact on profitability indicates an indirect impact that could be measurable. In the last webinar, we had learned how to use the effort versus impact matrix. Customizing that matrix, we can identify initiatives with high and medium impact on profitability so that we could focus on that. This matrix, we are not focusing on initiatives with low impact to the profitability as they do not make much impact to the organization. Hence, we are considering only the medium and high impact initiatives. In this matrix, the horizontal axis indicates the profitability and the vertical indicates strategic competitive edge. Now all we have to do is list down all the initiatives which fall under these areas identified in the VRIO analysis. For example, innovation and R&D was giving a high competitive edge and a high impact on profitability. Hence, it goes to the top right corner of the box, which here indicates high profitability and high competitive edge. Similarly, user customization and flexibility indicates a low competitive edge and a medium impact on profitability. Hence, it is going to the bottom left corner of the box.
Now this orange circle indicates that we should focus on these initiatives to gain instant and temporary advantage which also fall under low and medium effort. Once these have been implemented we can move on to the top rows initiatives to create a sustained competitive edge. Senior leaders have to take these kinds of decisions to invest depending on resource available and the investment available. Typically these kinds of decisions give the direction to the organization in the way to move forward. Now, once seeing the SWOT analysis and VRIO framework, we do not need to jump to conclusions that this is applicable only to organizations. This also could be applicable to their personal life. Now let us see a sample SWOT analysis matrix for a professional who wants to jump to a better job or have a higher salary. He lists down his strengths as having strong domain knowledge, is a hard worker, a quick learner, and has the ability to ask the right questions. And he is also customer focused and customer oriented. Weaknesses, he has a weak team management skills, weak in communication skills, has weaker public speaking skills, and weak training skills. He also mentions that the opportunities available for him are upgrading his knowledge in par with the industry. Having certifications like Six Sigma and project management. Make use of all of his networking events. He could also learn other foreign languages which could in turn help him go to on-site locations. If also there is a need in the company, he could take up special classes or lessons to go to go up far with the need. The threats you could face are competition from his colleagues and the industry moving towards new domain. Now when he maps his what analysis to a VRIO framework, he could mention the strengths, weakness, opportunities again. Having a strong domain knowledge would make him valuable and rare, but it is not inevitable and he is already being organized. So he gets a strategic competitive edge, which is medium. Hard working could be valuable and organized, but it is not rare and inevitable. Hence, having giving him a strategic competitive edge, which is medium again. The ability to ask right questions is always valuable and rare. And very rarely we see people asking the right questions during the right time. But it is not inimitable and is already organizing it and giving him an, another medium strategy competitive edge. His weaknesses when eradicated, having strong team management skills would make him valuable and rare and giving him a medium strategy competitive edge once again. Communication skills could be valuable but they are not rare and inimitable. Hence, the, the low strategic competitive edge. Upgrading his knowledge in par with the industry could be very valuable and at that moment would be rare and inimitable for a period of some time. And when he organized it, he could get high strategic competitive edge. Taking up certifications like Six Sigma project management would obviously make him, make him valuable, rare and inimitable for a period of some time, giving him a high strategic probability weight. Whenever there is a need in the company to be filled and he has upgraded his knowledge, that would make him valuable, rare and inimitable again for a short period of time, giving him high strategic probability weight. Once the VRIO framework is mapped, we could use an effect versus competitive edge matrix and create and prioritize which initiatives he should take up first to find the competitive edge. 